Uh, we're just going to reset the stage quickly. I'm Chris Mitchell with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and Next Century Cities. Um, and though I've been very involved with Next Century Cities, I want to take no credit for this event. Um, I've sort of bowed out from the planning. And so when you think of this event, um, you should be thanking NTIA and Next Century Cities, specifically uh, Deb and uh, Todd, Kay, um, Brendan, Kyra, uh, a number of other people that have all pitched in um, to help out. But um, I don't want anyone to think that <laughs> I helped. This is going to be my part in a minute here. We're going to do a, um, um, a five-person panel, well, a four-person panel with me as moderator talking about local government solutions. And as someone who cares deeply about local governments, I'm really thrilled and appreciative that we're in this event today, we're talking about what the federal government can do, we're talking about what local governments can do, we're talking about what private companies can do, we're talking about what municipalities can do. This is really an all hands on deck type approach. I think it's the only way that we're going to really solve this and make sure that we get the kind of networks and connectivity we need. So uh, I just wanted to, to make sure that's fresh in people's minds that this is really about all the solutions that we can muster. Uh, with that, let me start encouraging my panelists to, to come on up and to uh, grab some seats. Um, and I also just wanted to send one more thank you to the uh, sponsors that have uh, made this possible. It's wonderful to have a free event. Um, actually, if you don't mind, I'll take this seat. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, but um, it, to have an event that's of this caliber with uh, these great speakers, people coming in from all over the Chevy Solutions and not have to charge you is, is quite remarkable. So uh, thank you to the sponsors one more time. So um, being someone who once again cares deeply about local, I've decided to introduce the panelists uh, in order of proximity to Seattle. <laughs> uh, we're going to start with uh, Mayor Boudreau, uh, founding member of Next Century Cities. Um, you're in your second term as mayor in Mount Vernon, which is uh, just north of us. Um, please just uh, take a minute to tell us a little bit about what you've done. Well, sure. So um, uh, Mount Vernon, for all of you that don't know about us, we're about 32,000 people, small city in rural Skagit County. Um, we believe very strongly in a philosophy that our Seahawks here in Seattle made possible that um, why not us? Yes, we're a small city in a rural county, but we're surrounded by nearly 8 million people between Seattle, between Seattle and Vancouver, BC. So quite frankly, we offer just as much amenity um, sitting between those two populations as anyone does. Uh, so for us, we have a municipally owned broadband uh, structure. I inherited this. This was, I can't take credit for it at all. Um, it was started to be discussed in 1996 with then Mayor Sky Reichendeifer. Uh, Kim Kleppe, who's our IS manager, is here today. He was on the ground of getting this deployed. So we started with an institutional network in the early 2000s, and we've really incrementally stepped from institutional networks and partners into commercial and industrial zoned area of our city. Uh, we've grown since I've been in office and been interested in talking about this as an economic driver. We've grown our connections by over 340%. Uh, we're attracting small and medium-sized tech companies from the Seattle area, um, offering them broadband connections up to a gig, voice mm. data um, uh, um, pr platforms. Um, but not only do we offer that connectivity, we offer an, a very unique quality of life. Um, that we're finding is really, really important to tech-related um, industries. Uh, so I can talk more about some specifics, but uh, we think we're very unique. We think we're one of the most awesome places to be um, in our country, obviously, and we're really proud of the founding of that municipal network and just building on the success from there. Great. And uh, we'll try to um, avoid any discussion about how many jobs have left Seattle uh, to go up to Mount Vernon. <laughs> uh, we're going to move a little bit south to Sandy, Oregon, uh, right at the base of, uh, of Mount Hood. A beautiful, beautiful community. Um, City Council President Jeremy Pietzold is here, um, has been deeply involved with this project, and has professional background with fiber networks. So he's not someone who just had to learn it as part of being a, a public official. Um, and you spent nine years in the City Council and longer on the Sandy Net Board. Board. Um, so uh, please tell us a little bit about what Sandy has done. Sure. Yeah. So um, Sandy is a town of 10,000, so a little bit smaller uh, than your city. Um, and we're about 20 miles east of Portland. So if you're not familiar with Sandy, is if you were to go through Port to Portland to go to Mount Hood or over to Bend, you've driven through Sandy, probably uh -huh. by donuts and gas. Uh -huh. um, but we wanted to be a little bit more known for something than just donuts and gas. 
Um, about 13 years ago, uh, the city, uh, city hall was trying to get uh, high-speed internet, DSL, service at city hall, and uh, found out that they couldn't get that. And the incumbents there didn't provide the service. So that's when the council at the time decided, well, we better do something um, or we're going to dry up as a community. And so they formed a municipal ISP at that time offering DSL and wireless. Uh, we then uh, uh, did an undergrounding project where we were able to do some fiber around some businesses. Um, and then now we have uh, passed 100% of the homes in Sandy with uh, fiber um, in doing that. And so now we're known for gas, donuts, and high-speed internet <laughs> fiber. Um, we believe we're the cheapest uh, gig uh, fiber in the state of Oregon. Um, and so that's kind of our story there. Excellent. Um, and for people who may not be familiar, um, what the passing means is that every community, every person in the community could take service, uh, and more than 50% of people are taking service already. Um, so moving down the coast to uh, the city of Santa Cruz, uh, we have city council uh, member um, David Tarasas. Um, who has been very technical, a uh, very technical, savvy member of the uh, local city council. Um, he's chaired the committee that has led to municipal fiber investments, and, uh, and in the city is going to tell us a little bit about a great partnership. Uh, so please tell us what's happening down in Santa Cruz. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, Santa Cruz has a population of about 70,000 um, residents, and it quadruples in size based on tourism and our university population. So it varies tremendously. We also have one of the uh, slowest data speeds in the state. And over the past several years, we were approached by local tech businesses about what we could do as policymakers to really focus our efforts to kind of transform our city. So after work on a subcommittee, we led um, several efforts to uh, prioritize broadband policy uh, through our permitting processes, through making it easier for people to set up shop in town through our business licensing programs. That work led us to a public-private partnership with a local ISP. And through that, we're looking at um, building a municipal broadband system that will pass every resident in the city of Santa Cruz. And it'll be one of the first in Silicon Valley for a city to pursue this effort. We're also looking at how we work with that local internet service provider actually to operate this system. So municipally owned and um, privately operated. And for us, what it does is it relies on local technological expertise and also reflects our community values. Um, if you just go online and look at choosesantacruz.com, you'll see a lot of the businesses that we have that are operating in Santa Cruz. And they um, vary from a genomics institute that's affiliated with the University of Santa Cruz that relies on, uh, that requires a lot of high speed data, to local creatives, as well as our schools, what we heard about earlier. Um, we're very focused as a city to um, increase um, the uh, innovation in our city and also really respect all the local businesses and um, educational providers that really rely on high-speed data. So I'm really proud of this effort, and we're looking at building out this network um, by 2018. Um, the partnership with Cruz.io, which is a valued member of our community, has really kind of um, embraced our partnership with the city, so we're very proud of this highly local effort to increase uh, connectivity in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm really in love with Cruz.io, one of these ISPs that's been around forever. Um, and the name, for those of you who aren't giant geeks, um, is a play on input-output. So it's Cruzio or Cruz.io. It's just one of the best named companies I've ever come across. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, and our, our final panelist, uh, Mayor Wade Troxel, uh, he's in his first term um, as mayor, uh, previously was on the uh, city council for two terms. Uh, so please fill us in on what's happening uh, over in uh, Fort Collins. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. Uh, Fort Collins is a town of 160,000 citizens, and we, we we're 60 miles north of Denver along the Front Range. We're the home of Colorado State University. And... Uh, <clears throat> And in Colorado, we have uh, a state statute that basically doesn't allow municipalities to uh, offer any kind of broadband internet, even like in City Hall, to have an open uh, broadband unless it goes to the vote of the citizens. And so um, basically about uh, four or five years ago, we started discussing as a council um, heading in the direction towards having uh, ubiquitous uh, broadband within our community. And, and in 
this past November, uh, it was on the ballot and it passed by 83%. An important part, I think, of what we did was we've been in actively engaged with our community on this particular issue. And, and uh, there's a lot of input with uh, um, uh, where it is we're going. I would break it into two parts. So the first was really around benchmarking and benchmarking where we were and that led up and, and what kind of community um, we are and the kinds of, of, of services that uh, people would like, expect, and, and, and would support. And, and with that, you know, being a high-tech community, um, HP, Broad, Broadcom, uh, Intel, uh, AMD, and others, as well as um, Colorado State University, 32,000 uh, students, 8,000 of which are graduate students. So basically, um, uh, you know, there's usually not enough capacity. There's a lot of lone eagles, too, I talk about. Um, in one of our coffee shops, there's one guy that always has two laptops going, and he's probably burning more CPU cycles on the university's uh, uh, supercomputer, and he's a consultant to another one of our, our uh, uh, businesses in our community that has a world headquarters there. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that really require a lot of bandwidth in everything they're doing. Also, I think an important part, I, I mentioned benchmarking. Now we're really putting together our business plan, and we'll probably go to the voters in um, April 2017, which will be on the investment. And we're really looking at the full spectrum of options and what are the, the risks and opportunities related to those particular options going forward. You know, all the way from it would be our fifth utility if it was a, a city-owned utility or some blend in the middle with public-private partnerships. And so that's what we're assessing right now, and um, we'll take that to the voters in, in, in 2017. Excellent. Our goal for the rest of this discussion is to be very light, um, short comments, back and forth, discussion kind of approach. Um, one of the things that, that is true of all of you, I think, is that you engaged in, in long-term incremental type gains. Uh, it's something that I found striking in listening to uh, uh, Mayor Murray um, earlier talk about how the cost of doing this all at once is too great. And I think that's something that, that many others who have looked into this have found. And so I'm curious if you can each sort of give me a sense of how you broke this up into different bite-sized pieces in order to get where you are today. Uh, and maybe I'll start with you, um, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, so the city of Sandy, we started off as a uh, as an ISP offering DSL and wireless, and we started off just what we could pay for. You know, it just we brought in a little money, and we were able to expand a little bit farther. With DSL having limitations, as you know, about line footage, uh, wireless was the the way that we progressed quickly, um, and just started encompassing our entire city with wireless um, um, as we could pay for it um, until we could get 100% of our entire city under that umbrella of the wireless. Um, what we found in that situation, though, was we were getting to where, uh, well, Netflix happened, just to be honest. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we were so dense that uh, in just that free uh, wireless spectrum, we could not uh, continue to grow. And so we needed to look at the next model of going forward. We looked at um, fiber as being the uh, ultimate in product medium to be able to provide internet service uh, to the customers um, and how to get there. We looked at doing a pilot project, which I know a lot of cities have done that. And then looking at our pilot project in a town of 10,000, um, we realized the cost to roll those trucks to build that fiber for a small area of the town was going to be uh, not economically feasible comparatively to just doing the entire city at once. Plus, then there was the political backlash of why did that neighborhood get the fiber and we don't? And we need to wait two more years because to see if your model worked or not. It's a little bit different in a larger a city, but you know, a town of 10,000 could be a suburb of a, you know, or a, a, you know, a, a neighborhood of a different larger city of 100,000 or something like that. So in our Seattle community... Seattle might have that many people in some of the buildings. Right, exactly. <laughs> so you know, every community is going to be different. But that's what we found in our community, that we saved a lot of money by when we went to roll the fiber out to the homes. Um, that we decided to go with, uh, let's pass 100% of the homes when we go and do that. It helped out politically as well. 
And one of the benefits, I think, was that you had put fiber in the ground over the, over the course of the, the years that you're doing it. Mayor Boudreau, that's one of the ways that, that, that Mount Vernon's found ways of expanding. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? So the initial build out um, was really um, uh, institutional between police department and our uh, 911 uh, safety communication center. And so as we started doing that work, um, then we said, okay, hey, the hospital's this far away. Would the health system be interested in investing getting us that far? So it's really been this sort of leapfrog incremental um, growth. The Mount Vernon network has never been in debt. Um, we've always been able to pay as we go in a way, but I think that's really a testament to each city is very different. Um, you have the ability, we have the ability to do aerial and conduit undergrounding, so it depends on what you've got. Conduit's super expensive, so um, we've been able to, to do it really well for our size. And I think um, as Sandy is experiencing the smaller, you know, you can maybe get things done a little bit easier. Uh, what we've really found is that when we say, hey, we're, we want to go into a certain area, we'll literally go knock on doors of you know, businesses, say, hey, we're going to come this close to you. Would you pitch in a little bit more to get this far, which then enables us to reach for other businesses? And so it's just been a really um, nice segmented growth, knowing that it's a valued piece of the community, both with our institutions and our businesses, and they're willing to get on board and partner with the city to just make those connections and that expansion happen. Um, we look at our fiber and infrastructure as just as important as a sewer or a road, and I think that's an attitude that comes from you know, the, the leadership and government on down, um, which then doesn't add barriers in there with us. So. In Council Member Tarasas, I'm curious, how, was, there, was there a challenge in, in, in pushing forward this idea of more municipal fiber before you knew you'd be working with a local partner? Actually, from the very beginning, we partnered with local technologists in the city. Um, we knew we had a problem with our data speeds and we, from our constituents that we needed to prioritize broadband policy. Um, we formed an ad hoc subcommittee and we engaged them directly to come to the city so we could hear from them on what their needs were. And as a result of those discussions, we implemented policy, broadband policy, to look at a dig once policy in the city of Santa Cruz to streamline the permitting process and came up with a lot of uh, initial opportunities to increase our ability to get acceptance of broadband policy in the city. Through those efforts, we led to um, additional work to partner with Cruzio. Cruzio, as Chris mentioned earlier, has been a valued community member in our city. And so when we, when we work with them on this, it is a true community partnership to look at how we can work together to actually build out a broadband network for the city that passes to every home, to increases the level of connectivity to our local schools, and raises the level of data transmissions for our local businesses. It, it is a true community partnership, and so when we started with those initial discussions, they've actually grown for us as a community and, and helped to strengthen not only the council's uh, prioritization of broadband policy, but also helped to uh, develop um, an adoption and kind of a willingness to kind of transform internal uh, processes within the city to move uh, policy forward even more. Um, well, I want to I want to introduce uh, the long term approach from you. I think we had a great conversation mm -hmm. yesterday, and um, I will preface this by saying that the first time I saw the Great Sand Dunes National Monument in Colorado, which is far south of you, I was stunned. And I went from there to Zion National Park. The Great Sand Dunes are the biggest sand dunes in the world. And, um, and sorry, in North America. And Zion is 3,000 foot cliffs of sandstone because over time, sand turns into stone. It was a remarkable juxtaposition. Now, I think a lot of times people look at Herculean tasks and they think, oh, how are we ever going to get there? I want to ask you about the long term undergrounding project that it turns out your family was involved with before you were sure. mayor. Sure. I, I mean, if we do go the direction of the full service utility uh, around broadband, um, and a little bit of perspective, in, in Fort Collins, we're 99.9% .9 undergrounded as an electric utility. And um, that's that, that's big deal. We're one of the few, I think, in the United States at that level of, of undergrounding. And that was a decision made by a council back in the 1960s where my dad served on that council to underground the electric power lines. That's when the community was 30,000 people. Now it's 160,000 people. And it was a decision that, you know, um, I, I, I don't understand everything about it, but I know it would always be a difficult decision because of 
it would add, add a lot of costs and for what benefit? And you'd, and you'd have to always you know, make that. Well, they made that decision. And it's one of those things today. Um, people talk about, boy, um, nice, nice views and that sort of thing, but they don't see what they don't see. And that is a lot of wires and things like that. It was decisions that were made years ago that puts us in a place today where, uh, where we want to be in the future. And I think I look at the broadband issue in much the same way is it'll be a, a, a major undertaking and it will be a large investment. And to leverage the assets that are in place, such as the undergrounding, and we have uh, conduit currently uh, laid and, and we have expertise and, and in that uh, arena as well and, and other sorts of things. And so, you know, I look at this as, uh, uh, you know, a large generational um, kind of uh, legacy, kind of a project that would, you know, enable certain things to happen. And we've had the broad discussion within our community. Um, we have a, 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 a at our at our city staff level, it cuts across the entire organization, including our our social sustainability and our economic health and our IT and our utilities and things like that. So it cuts across, and it's one of those things where you know it's it's really looked at as fundamental for the community. And, and, you know, what we're doing now is, is, is in what form will that be? And I think one of the things I'd be thinking if I was in the audience is, well, that's great. If I had a time machine, I sure would go back and start those policies 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago. I'm curious from, you know, you've seen this and you've lived through it, but if you put yourself in that position, is it too late to get started on those? Yeah. Personally, it, I, I don't think it's ever too late because, you know, there's, what you do is you start chipping away at it, and, and, there's, and it finds uh, funds from various resources, streets, and others, you know, that enable the, the decisions to be made in that direction. When you, when you repair a street, that provides an opportunity to, to, to do some infrastructure. We've improved curb and gutter and some other things. And so it's one of those things that's making the decision to get you on the path. It's really um, one of the things we have as a city council, and I chair it, is uh, what we call a futures committee. And, you know, it's one of those things where I, th I encourage other communities to, 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 to think about what are the horizontal things that we're trying to do as a community and think about the horizon and not we get caught up in a lot of the incremental things that we have to deal with. And it's the horizontal aspect and then build towards those outcomes. And that will happen, I think, naturally, organically through the normal processes of, of running the city. I think one of the things that I think uh, Dr. Edelman and Matt in their conversation touched on was people that are in the room. So when we're doing large planning for public works type projects, you know, when I took office, Kim needs to be in the room because he knows where, you know, we should be building out, where that conduit should be going. And um, there were instances of a decade ago doing a large major intersection um, public works project that we didn't put it in because he wasn't in the room. And now we think of that as a lot of our major infrastructure projects that we think about the technology piece, you know, when we're doing flood protection projects, uh, when we're building infrastructure, new, you know, new libraries and things like that, that, that is part of the conversation, uh, along with a, obviously a conduit ordinance and things like that. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing in Sandy is, uh, you know, we're having projects being built where they're gonna build a, a water main, you know, three or four or five miles down the road mm -hmm. and you come to council and we're like, and of course I was the first one like, well, where's the conduit, where's the fiber? Oh, well, and so that changed the perspective of it and now we have the technology director slash general manager of the SandyNet um, is at every single uh, development meeting mm -hmm. and is at those meetings for all of them so that technology doesn't get forgotten along the way. And I think a lot of uh, communities um, they think of technology because it's a newer technology in the last 20, 30 years for a city versus, or maybe even 10 years, uh, versus uh, water and sewer or roads, which have been around for, you know, 100 years. One of the things that, that I often hear from economic development type folks when we talk about this is, um, um, I don't know what the return is going to be on putting that conduit in the ground. And I just want to briefly touch on that because I think... Um, you, can't, you, you don't just put it in the ground. You need to develop a plan and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering, you know, as you were thinking about the city of Santa Cruz and, and Sandy in particular, because both of you are, had more technical backgrounds, you know, what, what do you do? I mean, it, it, you don't just say put conduit in the ground. What do you do to make that work 
so that you can come forward to the year 2016 and have the kind of successes that you're now seeing? Well, I, I would say that you know, we knew as a city that we weren't going to be in the business of being the service provider and providing the infrastructure for the city for, for others to take advantage of was a really important civic goal because it allowed us to have widespread spread data for a lot of our providers, the libraries, the schools, as well as our uh, core city uh, functions such as public safety and, and health. Um, so we knew that and by working with a local uh, partner, we were able to leverage that, their knowledge about being the operator to actually reach out to help provide that service and expand it throughout the city. Through our analysis, we sh we've shown that by leasing back you know, the, the uh, conduit to a, uh, um, an operator, we're able to provide a valued um, civic infrastructure without having um, our general fund obligated to help finance it. So that was our approach, and that's one where we feel very confident about the return, not only uh, socially and culturally, but also from an economic standpoint to retain a lot of the businesses that we have in town now. So in Sandy, you know, we had an undergrading project um, going through the middle of town, and during that, we were ripping up all the sidewalks along town to, you know, for beautification and to, and to bring down, like as Chris was mentioning earlier, all these lines that were crisscrossing um, our community. And uh, so we were bringing that down. So we put conduit in at that time. It makes sense, you know, when the trench is open, you throw that in. Um, when we went to do the fiber of the home project, um, we looked at, you know, the cost difference between going all underground or having uh, aerial as well. We only had about 20% of our uh, availability to even do aerial. And so looking at it from, you know, some economics of maintaining and managing that fiber, um, we decided, you know, let's put it all underground because we don't need to then go out and buy bucket trucks. We don't need to have guys up on in the windstorms and the ice storms you know, trying to replace uh, some lines in the middle of the night on top of a bucket truck. And doing that, they can actually stand on the ground. And so some of the equipment there is cheaper. It does cost more to go underground. And so it's, but it was also one of those policies of we're trying to get all of our communications and things underground um, as well for some of the security. Not to say that aerial is any less secure. I think aerial fiber is, um, uh, can be just as secure. You know, you have the differences between um, ice storms and someone hitting a telephone pole um, in a car accident as much as you do having um, a backhoe dig that, that up. So you need to know where that is located. Because with our buried fiber, uh, we've had, you know, um, backhoes and other things, you know, get mismarked and, and pull that up as well. So that you still have that there. So, but in the process of it, we looked at, if I don't have to have buy bucket trucks and, and train staff to be up on poles and those type of things, it's going to be a cost savings and a lot easier to maintain for us. When uh, we had a previous Next Century Cities event, um, Mayor Boudreaux was going to speak about health, and sh um, health uh, impacts and the way it's impacted the hospital owner. Her, her <laughs> son had a convenient um, health emergency that I'm a little suspicious of for the timing and the anecdote, how it worked. Right. I I'm curious, how, how's the health system impact in, uh, in uh, Mount Vernon from the uh, the fiber network that you've built and made open to different providers. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, I gave a little talk about frisbees and fiber and how that all intersects. So my son hurt his foot um, playing frisbee. We took him to urgent care. He had some films done there. Um, that film automatically went to his pediatrician, the podiatrist, the surgeon. And so it was just a very, very simple example of how the um, connectivity in our healthcare system um, is so important to save money economically, provide better health care, um, but also be an attractor um, into our community when people are looking to relocate. One thing they look about is health care. So our hospital system is in um, three different hospitals now in a couple of different counties. Um, all of their hospitals and the clinic systems and many of the other private providers are all hooked on to an electronic medical record. And so what's been great is that because we have the fiber network, they have the capability um, to send really high um, volume images through, you know, you can think about MRIs and what kind of bandwidth that they need. So we've really been able to help the hospital system expand, um, provide them that ability to do their jobs better. Um, just recently, the hospital announced an $80 million project to convert their medical record to a new vendor and hired 53 people to come into Mount Vernon to make that happen. So as you can see, the intersection between good health care, 
technology, job creation, um, and the betterment of the community is very evident um, in a simple way. So the, the ability for us to help in that is really crucial. Um, although I have to say, some of us forget how we have to plan for that. So when the hospital leased a new space, uh, the CEO and I were at lunch and I said, you guys have fiber to that building, right? And um, for somehow that all got missed. Fortunately, we had a big pole like right in that parking lot and they got connected very quickly. But it was just an example of who was in the room when we picked that property, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's just a great story for us in our community to, to show the, the benefits and many different fronts of that broadband access. Well, and one of the benefits, I think, isn't just that the hospital's doing this stuff, but your hospital is growing and adding on more capacity mm -hmm. than it otherwise would, right. absent your connectivity. You have that guy from Microsoft that I know that is very innovative. And yes, so we, have, uh, we host Men's Northwest, which is um, uh, a provider region-wide. They were contracted to deploy these um, electronic medical records throughout the entire region, and they happen to be based right in our um, historic downtown. Um, we have the ability to give them strands of their own. Um, we have a vault in City Hall that they use currently in a, in a much more um, really northwest Washington um, ability to provide that, not only just for Skagit Regional Health, mm -hmm. but others as well. And I'm curious in Santa Cruz, what are some of the, the benefits? When I first met the, your, your economic development director, uh, he talked about an unsafe road that this would possibly save lives uh, by having a, a fiber network. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a variety of uh, benefits. I mean, not knowing the specific one, our, and our economic development director is, uh, or manager is uh, Jay Guevara, and he's someone who's been very focused on helping to implement uh, broadband policy within the city. I think that um, our uh, ChooseSantaCruz.com site lists the breadth of our businesses that we have operating in the city, from university to um, private entrepreneurs, and I think that the scope of our interest in making sure that they are satisfied with the infrastructure in their city is a priority for city government. I think that also when we look at our infrastructure, we're a town that just celebrated uh, this year, in fact, is our 150th anniversary. Our wharf just celebrated its 100th anniversary. And when we look at investing in our infrastructure, we have a lot to do. Um, our roads are, are deteriorating. We have um, infrastructure that in many ways is substandard. And I think of um, whether it's the safety of the road that Jay mentioned or the, the security of our infrastructure, it's a priority for us to really kind of do the most we can to make sure that we have world-class facilities in a town that is not only historic, but one that I feel is one of the more beautiful cities along our coastline. And the more that we can invest in that infrastructure to make it state-of-the-art, helps us to grow the types of businesses to keep people employed there and also allows us to, to foster a future economy that's vibrant for families and the type the residents that are living there now. Well, I think you're expecting pe people to be staying there, right, and working from there more often than commuting north into the Silicon Valley. Yeah, we have, um, to thank you for bringing that up, we have about 20,000 people that leave Santa Cruz every day to commute over um, to Silicon Valley, to Santa Clara County. And when we look at that environmental footprint, we look at investing in broadband technologies, one that helps to decrease the number of people that travel over Highway 17 every morning. Um, it also creates a highly local economy. I mean, we have a lot of technologists in town. And the more we can tap into that to help grow that, it helps our economy, it helps create jobs, but also it helps create a sense of localism for us to look at we, all the businesses that have been prospering there based on our proximity and university culture. And so I think that um, for us, there's a lot of multifold um, success stories when we look at our broadband policies. Um, I'm going to finish up with, uh, with two questions here in the sense of um, if you have a question, be ready to give me a very brief question for the, the panel, please. We have uh, two mics that are going to be available. So um, I will look for hands in a minute, and then we'll circulate some mics. And again, keep your question as brief as possible, please, so we can get a few extra in. Um, Next Century Cities and East Two for Local Self-Reliance, we did a video with you about the Sandy Net. And in doing that, you know, we talked with a local real estate person who said that He's constantly hearing from people that just want to move, you know, and, and their question is, do they have access to fiber? How is that impacting Sandy in terms of people sure. wanting to come in and maybe people saying you should build out and that sort of thing? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, so um, we do, so Sandy was the fifth fastest growing city in the state of Oregon, um, its last census taking. 
And then with the economic downturn, you know, it uh, kind of everybody slowed down. But we're starting to pick that back up. And with real estate, we have actually a real estate agent on our um, city council as well. And what we hear from them is that the number one or number two question from people looking for houses in Sandy is, does it have fiber? Is the fiber on the house already? You know, because they want that. Um, the housing market there is really like just filled up. I mean, it's, it's very hard to uh, find um, homes. And when they do go in the market, they go fast. We also noticed that sometimes, I was being told this story here the other day, that um, people will put a picture of their house and a picture of all the amenities of their house, and they'll take a picture of the O&T, the fiber, you know, and put that up on the, the web page there. So it is uh, very um, popular, let's say. So, you know, we charge, um, you know, $39.95 for 100 megs up and down and a gig for $59.95 a month um, up and down. No contracts, no bandwidth caps. If you don't like us, uh, you can drop us. We must not be doing our job um, in providing that service. And so you can say, you know, we're quite popular. Um, the, we're right in the middle of actually expanding our urban growth boundary. And in the state of Oregon, we have a lot of laws around how you increase your urban growth boundary. And so we're able to uh, only increase it by 333 acres uh, this, for the next uh, go around. But, you know, we're seeing people um, already lining up to want to do development in Sandy. And, you know, we have a lot of other great amenities as well, but we know fiber is one of that uh, amenity that they are asking for. And, and um, so much so that we have a three-month waiting list uh, to get connected. We just cannot connect them fast enough. Um, and, uh, you know, our staff is trying to do it as fast as we can. And we have about 10 to 15 new sign-ups every week. Um, our fiber to the home um, is only 22 months. It's kind of like a little baby. We don't even say years yet. We, we count it by months. <laughs> um, about 22 months old. Um, and, you know, we had the initial build out. And then after that build out, it was, um, um, they just keep coming. We think it will slow down. Eventually, we'll run out of homes <laughs> to build to but, um, in doing so. But, yeah, it's really changed. There's a lot of people, a lot of younger generation um, first-time home buyers wanting to get out of that metro region of what I would call Portland out to be able to afford to buy a house, and uh, they're picking Sandy. Well, and that ties into one of the challenges you're facing in Fort Collins, which is you have a, a, an urban area. Mm -hmm. You have um, – you, Colorado is insane for local government solutions to broadband. I mean, the, the, the interest there, the models that are flourishing is fascinating. But you have a little bit of a tension, as I understand it, between the smaller, a little bit more rural towns around you and, and yourself. What's right. happening there? You know, and, and, you know, so we're landlocked and with uh, communities around us, so we're not growing. So we're more of an infill uh, community. But we actually work well, I think, with our area communities. Um, one of the models that demonstrates that is uh, four municipalities that make up Platte River Power Authority, which is actually has a lot of, um, uh, uh, the, of, of, of the fiber links uh, between our four communities and things like that. And that's been built out over the years. And so I think we do have a good sense of, of regionalism. And I would just point out, um, as our community, we think of uh, our community as, and the, our city government as a platform and a platform for innovation. And that is broadly speaking. And so you take whatever area, but clearly broadband is key to any area. In, in June, um, opened an exhibit at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Uh, on an exhibit for places of innovation. And it features four columns in the 2010s going forward, particularly around clean, renewable energy. And when you talk about smart grid and those sorts of things, that's all necessary for to have the, the infrastructure necessary. And the idea with a, a platform uh, for the city government for innovation is we do demonstration projects that help move the needle for um, uh, the federal government and others to, to understand how to implement in a broader way. And so we look at it as our, and that becomes a core strategy, I think, for our economic uh, development is these demonstration projects with the city as a platform. Uh, do we have any questions, and where are the microphones? Oh, I'm bogarting them. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a we have a question in the back? We have a couple here in the middle. Um, so as the microphone is moving toward you, um, let me just say a, a very brief comment. Um, broadband is doing very interesting things in terms of how cities interact. 
Um, the, the, the dividing line between Missouri and Kansas is legendary for job stealing, tax credits, throwing money at, at site locations to try and get firms to switch from one part of the border to the other. But they work together to get Google Fiber. Chattanooga is spending probably millions of dollars for the right to offer its incredible comparative advantage to its neighbors. Um, I, I find this quite astounding, and I'm curious, as members of local governments, if you've seen the way partnerships and regional broadband can help change the dynamic of the competition at all. And, and just you know, very quickly, because I want to get to the audience that just came to me, sorry. So in Skagit County, we have about 120,000 people, so we have the, the benefit of a smaller geographic area. We have four major cities, um, so we're, and we're separated from them by rivers. So across the river is the city of Burlington, which they're over there. Um, and so we're always available to help them if anything they need. They've got their own fiber as well in the ground. Um, that extends them from the city of Burlington out to the port of Skagit, which is our sort of regional industrial area. And I think almost every single business at the port is on fiber. I'm almost. Um, Andrew's here somewhere with that. And then um, our city of Anacortes is a little bit farther, and anything that we can do to help them get into that, you know, we want to do. Um, just recently, our Skagit County government is sort of resurrecting a plan and a conversation about an entire county-wide fiber plan and what they would love to see before then they start help us funding with the economic distressed county funding is that can the cities get together, tell us you know, how they need to deploy, how we can all work together, and then they've got some resources to help fund that process. So we're able to do that in a real cooperative environment. We don't look at it as a competition. It's to, for us, we're helping all of us raise economically, um, but then for our residents too. Mm -hmm. So we're small enough to do it like that. Yeah, and no, I, I, I agree. Um, Santa, the city of Santa Cruz is the county seat of uh, Santa Cruz County, and it's really kind of created a discussion that, that's actually spilled over into surrounding counties. Uh, Monterey County, which some arguably would say it's the solid basket of the nation. We've got a lot of areas out there that are not connected to data. And it's created uh, really kind of opportunities for us to really look at how we connect surrounding communities. So the discussion alone and the policy making that's taken place have really kind of prioritized broadband policy development in other areas in uh, the greater Monterey, Monterey Bay. I think in, uh, for Sandy, one of the things we did a few years ago was not necessarily what Sandy did. We've been an ISP for 13 years, but our county itself, Clackamas County, went out and uh, applied for a BTOP grant. And so they were one of um, two different counties that received in Oregon a BTOP grant that allowed to take fiber all the way up the top of Mount Hood. You know where Mount Hood is. It's a long ways up there. Uh, well, not the very tip top, but, you know, government camp. And then all the way down across to Wilsonville at the other side of our county um, and out through uh, huge national forest areas and these type of things where it's very hard to get these type of speeds out there to connect all the schools and anchor institutions and provide this to the community. And so, you know, we're just the first of the big, you know, of a city to hop on and use that to gain our backhaul back into um, Portland where, you know, you can, you can get uh, the cheap ISP. And so in doing so, um, that collaboration, we're seeing a lot of other communities around us go, wait a minute, Sandy's only 10,000, you know, they're that, you know, mountain town type attitude. You know, we're down here, we want what they have. How are they doing it? And there's a lot of uh, political uh, push um, and comments, and we get a lot of phone calls and questions of how you did this in Sandy because we want to do this in other communities around our county and around our region. So. Anything else? You just touched on that. So. Well, I touched on the Platte River Power Authority. I think another important aspect, and I, I think it's relevant to other communities as well, is being the home of Colorado State University, which has a statewide mission. And, you know, one of the reasons we have strong computing historically is um, uh, with uh, the old ARPANET and NSFNET and those sorts of things. You know, being uh, the land-grant university and, and across the United States, we're right on that, and it's because of the university. And I think that's an important integrator as well in communities beyond our own. Excellent. We have a question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve Rapp, Vancouver Public Schools, Vancouver, Washington, which is by Portland, Oregon, not the one up north. Um, and as a school district, we've got, um, we've taken advantage of the E-rate program. We have great connectivity in the schools. Um, we have Wi-Fi on buses now. But what I'm here to try to tackle is that, you know, we've got 70% of our kids who don't have internet home. Um, and we don't have a municipal network right now. So I just want to know, are any of you guys partnering with your schools to provide discounted or low cost to, um, 
families of students and do, do your districts have on um, one-to-one -one programs? You know, we have iPads for all the kids kind of thing. Is there anything similar like that? And do you partner with the schools at all to, to take care of that challenge? I mean, I can go. Um, and so in, um, in our school district, um, Oregon Trail School District, um, our city is kind of the hub of that, but it goes way beyond our city. I mean, all the way up to Mount Hood and down to, um, to a town called Boring, Oregon. But um, is encompassing of the whole entire school district. So we have about four sites in the uh, school district. And they currently get dark fiber from uh, the county provider, um, uh, part of that BTOP grant. Um, but we're able to, since we passed all the, uh, every street, every home, every business in Sandy, um, we've now partnership and just like, we're just going to give you uh, free dark fiber uh, for that um, to help out the schools, the goodwill, as well as it doesn't really cost us any additional money to do that. Um, and so they're able to get that dark fiber. As far as going to the homes and that type of thing, um, right now, you know, we're starting out, we don't know where we'll land on that. We're not a very large ISP and we don't encompass the entire school district. We do offer a wireless services outside. Um, uh, we have several towers around our town where we still offer wireless service outside of our city, but we cannot hit the entire school district and so it's very hard. Um, one way is just we keep our rates as low as we can possibly keep our rates. Um, you know, with that 100 megs of fiber at 39.95 is the smallest package we have for fiber, um, and um, and so that's where we're we're landing at this point. But we're looking at building um, and got some grants to build into some uh, MDUs, lower economic areas of town as well that we'll uh, be pursuing here in the near future. Um, and then for Mount Vernon, we're an open service provider network, so we have nine ISPs that conduct the service. But because our school district was part of our original instant, inter, institutional network build out, they have their own, you know, connections like a dark fiber type thing as well. So they save significant amounts of money on just service because of that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll also say that um, for the city of Santa Cruz, like Sandy, the, the school district extends out of the city's border, but our agreement is to prioritize the connections to all of the local schools in town as part of our, our build out. One of the things that, that we've seen is, sorry, we have other people. So. <laughs> um, one of the things we've seen is most of the areas the, where we've seen local governments take action it has been within the local government, but um, there's a, one of the other founding members of Next Century Cities is Winthrop, which is part of a, a small farming community in Minnesota. They built a, a co-op with a combination of other local cities as well. They're going to be talking about that in a later panel a little bit. Um, but they built that, the boundaries um, to include the school district. And there's a couple of other precedents, not many, but there's, there are people increasingly thinking about building these networks within school district boundaries rather than municipal boundaries, which I think shows uh, you know, some, some evolution on the subject. Uh, good morning. I'm, hello? I'm sure he'll turn it on now. That's oh, right. Okay. Uh, I, my name is Adam Haas uh, with Converse Communications out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, great meeting. Um, Sounds, there are two states that are kind of have weird policies about allowing, you know, municipal uh, services, Colorado and also the state of Washington. So I'm kind of interested in what your perspectives are about the state's role in either encouraging this involvement or discouraging it. Well, I, I, I think the state does have an important role in it uh, from an economic development perspective, I think from a, a social equity and some other sorts of uh, things, uh, just competitiveness and other. Um, and, you know, I, with, with respect to that one state statute, uh, SB 152, which um, it was 2005, you know, that was the incumbent uh, 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 cable companies that, uh, you know, got that passed. And, and is yet to be um, repealed. And, and if you look at the broad, uh, I've lost the count of the number of communities that have basically um, brought back their home rule as about related 60. to the, about mm -hmm. 60, about their, broad, their broadband. And talk about, you know, I think a groundswell of public opinion, you know, in that really counter to the way our state uh, General Assembly has operated you know, I think that's a, a direct indicator. So I think the state does have a role. And right now, I don't, I don't think they're, they're standing up to their, that, that role. 
I think on a political level, I get highly irritated by some of the rhetoric around this idea that states should tell the cities, you know, what they should do infrastructure-wise. Um, I think we should graduate, and it's kind of nice to see some of the the White House standing up and the the most recent FCC rulings about. You know, really, um, fiber access should be treated as a, a basic infrastructure. It should be similar to how our country wanted to make sure electricity went to every home in this country. And so as a mayor of a small city, and what I feel as mayors and local governors the most connected to the body of our country and our residents, um, it, it irritates me to no end that um, they think that um, they should weigh in to protect um, maybe private interest. I don't see big corporations coming in doing building out fiber to the home in small communities like the city of Mount Vernon. And so to try and prevent that is, is wrong, quite frankly. It'd be kind of cool to see some of our presidential candidates have anything to say about this particular subject, um, have any depth to some of their comments about economic strategy and broadband. So that might be kind of cool. Maybe um, some of our Twitter comments today could get around to that conversation. Who knows? <laughs> but. <laughs> usually, usually I provide balance in the other direction, um, but I, I would say that, that one of the things to keep in mind is that we're moving from a, a, a system in which the federal government required that telephone companies make significant investments and spread that, and they made sure that they could recover the cost of connecting everyone. The federal government decided to do away with that system more or less, and I think states are dealing with the repercussions of that in different ways. So um, I don't want to, you know, there's a lot of people in this room who, um, who have different opinions on the matter, and, but we, as, as four local governments that have all taken to action themselves, we certainly have one point of view. Um, additional questions? Yes, sir, with the microphone. Yeah, Paul Haugen, Director of Innovation and Technology from the City of Auburn. For those of us who have already kind of gotten into the policy issue and the public-private partnerships and departments working together, how many of you, and do you have advice for us on, is there any grant funding out there? I mean, I'm one of these guys that doesn't have the patience to wait. I got school kids out there that need access and they need it now. Um, so what kind of advice have you got or how many of you actually tapped into other funding sources to help kick off that infrastructure backhaul build out? I, I, I could say that um, in Auburn, it's Auburn, California? Uh, Auburn, Washington. Auburn, Just Washington. Just oh, okay, well, in, in, um, in California, there, there are lease revenue bonds that were going to be floated to help finance the infrastructure. So there won't be any um, sort of um, um, cloud on our um, revenue for our general funds. So we'll be able to actually help finance this, and then with revenues through the lease, we'll actually pay back the system. So for us, we can. Uh, we have um, you know AAA bond rated city, so we've got really good rates. We are able to help um, leverage that good credit rating and provide financing to build out the uh, infrastructure. Uh, you know, we did a revenue bond to build out our infrastructure. We we're able to do that easily uh, because we already ran as an ISP uh, beforehand, and we had a proven track record. So that made it a little bit easier for us to get a revenue bond um, and going forward. There are some type of grants, you know, we, you know, it's, BTOP has already come and gone, but uh, BTOP allowed, because uh, whatever our county did, allowed us to get that backhaul outside of our community, which allows us to be able to provide that gig service inside um, our community, because we do have that um, dark fiber infrastructure that leaves, leaves our community. Um, so, but, sorry, can I ask you to just follow on one particular question, which is, you didn't just get a revenue bond. You spent more than a year agonizing over spreadsheets to figure out how to make them. Can you just tell us briefly about yeah. how that worked before you were able to go to the market to get funding? Sure, yeah. We actually, man, it was more than a year. <laughs> it was several years. So we kind of did a reverse model. You know, a lot of companies will say, well, what does it cost to do this? And then that's what we're going to charge people. And we kind of took an approach of, we wanted, we, our basic service, we didn't want to go above $40. And so we said, this is what we want to charge people. Let's figure out how to make it work charging that dollar amount. How can we engineer it? How can we? And so it took us a lot longer in time. I think you know, we could have, people were telling us we could charge $50 or $60 or $70 a month for that 100 make service, and people would still buy the service. But we really wanted it to be a livability issue um, and keep that money on the tables of our residents um, and, and do it um, as cheaply as we could. And so. It did take us you know, several years to figure out what that model or how we could actually build the system to meet that target of staying under $40 a month. 
We've had some county funding available to compete for grant-wise, so I don't know what you would have, but we did that. Um, we, I know there's some USDA type of funding, so I'm not familiar with all the, the federal grant programs, but things, places that you might not be realize could be available. So that might be something. Um, but one of our recent projects is running fiber up Little Mountain, which is a small little mountain in our city. And that was a direct fund between the Skagit 911 and the city of Mount Vernon, we just we both pitched in to do that, but we saw the benefit of having that up to the telecommunications towers, um, maybe increased cell tower revenue that then came back into the system too. So we literally just partnered with some of the other institutions for those builds. And I would just um, point out, you know, I talked about city as a platform and doing demonstrations, and there's a lot of areas federally that could be a demonstration that could add to the investment for the infrastructure in different sorts of ways, things related to all the smart cities kind of initiatives that would directly align with uh, these broadband initiatives, things, you know, we got uh, our advanced metering infrastructure for our electric utility through a, uh, uh, in partnership with uh, uh, the feds and, and so forth. So I think there's opportunities like that to think about it more in this holistic where you can also improve the infrastructure, um, and, and that's where you need to have probably some matching funds. And so that's where you're leveraging, you know, money that you would be spending already through other um, initiatives that would be directly in line with uh, broadband. Uh, Mark, can I ask you to stand up, please, Mark Erickson? Just for folks who are interested, I would encourage you to take a look at him. If you're interested in how small communities were able to leverage their ability to raise some money and then get and then um, attract other money with that, um, Mark's model with RS Fiber in Minnesota is terrific, and you may want to just ask him about it. We're working on a case study that uh, Next Century Cities will be releasing uh, soon about that as well. Uh, we have time for um, another quick question. Um, who, I'm sorry, I see people, a lot of people raising their hand. I'm sorry, you have a microphone. Do we have one other microphone already out in the audience? Oh. Okay. okay, so last question then, thank you. Okay, um, my name is Keria Wong. I'm with the Seattle Community Technology uh, Advisory Board. And um, I have two questions. Um, number one, what's the adoption rate among the immigrant communities? And the second question is, uh, what kind of strategy do you have in outreaching and supporting non-English speaking residents? Thank you. So um, I think, Jeremy, you're probably the only person who can really answer that question. Um, to be clear, you're the only one that is serving everyone in the community currently. Um, we have two networks that are um, in, the, in the direction of going to be serving everyone in the community, and you're serving businesses, so um, um, in uh, Mount Vernon to be specific. So um, do you have any sense of? You know, like um, Chris said, we pass 100% of our community. Um, I don't have statistics um, on those numbers that you're asking for. Um, so I don't have a, a feel for it. We're just trying to keep up with the demand of wanting to put it in. You know, um, we've attached um, over 50%, 60% of the homes already in Sandy, and we've got um, in just 22 months. And we have um, 10 to 15 people signing up every week, and uh, eventually we'll just run out of homes to hook up. I, I don't have those numbers for you. And uh, I think that's sort of the next great challenge. You have. You have networks that are already built and are expanding, or you're about to be building in, in partnership in various ways. And once you get the fiber, some people will think, you're done. All right, you can just relax. But now the next step is to make sure everyone can benefit from it. Um, and to that end, I would like to end with a short round of um, asking you, what does success look like in your communities um, from a position of where you are today? Um, you know, how will you know you've succeeded when you get there? Uh, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think success for us is we're right in this, the business plan, um, and we're, we're putting together an expert panel to, to basically uh, to critically our, um, analyze what we're doing, and, and then with the next step being uh, the option if it goes to the voters or whatever that next step is. But I think uh, success for us is, is to be, uh, and we tend to think about going slow to go fast, be very intentional about what we're trying to do in order to make the decisions where we, we have the buy-in of the community and then to, to execute in a way that, 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 that meets that, uh, uh, that trust of our community. Great. I think um, it's a hard question. Success for our community, I think, would be where people don't think of the Internet as even being there. They just 
it's there, right? Just like we have electricity, we turn on electricity. We don't think if we have enough electricity um, to power, uh, you know, the appliances we have in our house. We don't think about is there enough water coming down the pipe to whether or not, you know, we can flush the toilet or take a shower, or have a drink of water. Um, and I think that um, the success is just being invisible in a way because um, no one is complaining about not having the speed to be able to do something. They aren't complaining about having, um, you got to get off the internet, we've got to do homework. You know, we have to stop streaming that TV show over here because I'm filling out a job application over here and I need to get this turned in. You know, it's just part of our daily lives. It's being able to um, not be concerned <coughs> about that spinning wheel or the bandwidth caps that we have for our community, that they can get out and enjoy our great environment of our city itself, our parks and the, the things around us, and um, not be uh, concerned about um, starting that download or, or anything about um, their job or commuting because that fiber is in place. <coughs> Yeah, for, for me and for the city of Santa Cruz, I think um, success is to construct a, a local bridge to close the digital divide in our community. I think we've got an opportunity, really, to build the infrastructure for this generation and the next. You know, I mentioned that we are celebrating these anniversaries of major infrastructure projects that are, you know, f former uh, <coughs> electeds and staff you know, prioritized to build, you know, not only our wharfs and construct the, the infrastructure of our town that we've relied on for generations. This is, this is the type of in infrastructure that's going to create jobs for the future, for our economy, f the cultural resources for the students that go to school there. And for me, I feel it's like just building that foundation for, for them. And so having that local bridge using local businesses and local technological resources for me is like kind of coming full circle to some of our historical <coughs> legacies of our town. Um, for me, as a, a town, a small city, we rely greatly on property tax and sales tax to just uh, provide our basic services. We've got quite an imbalance of residential versus commercial industrial property. So in, in a bit of a selfish way for us, it's the acceleration of economic growth. You know, we would love a dozen new businesses in our city in the next few uh, few years. And that, in turn, generates revenue and jobs, which in turn help us reach that social development piece with broadband access and all that. So um, I would say for a, a concrete goal and success for us is going to really be seeing those new companies come in, the exciting, you know, small to medium size, uh, whether it's tech companies or not. We have an organic fruit broker that does business all over the world because they can do it in their, you know, business here in Mount Vernon. So um, I think that will be the measure for us is that success because that's, that's the beginning. Um, then trickles down to the benefits for the society as a whole. Great. One of the things that I just wanted to end in drawing attention to um, is something you said that may have slipped by and all the other great information on the panel, which is that, um, Jeremy, when somebody sells their home in Sandy, they don't just put up photos of, you know, the house, the kitchen, the bathroom. They take a photo of the device that proves they have fiber on the side of their house, and they include that. That's pretty remarkable. <laughs> yeah, I just heard that the other day, and I was like, really? Because, you know, you're trying to sell your house, and you're trying mm. to sell the greatest-looking pictures of your house, and <laughs> here's yeah. a picture of a piece of electronics with yellow fiber. Well, let me uh, lead the audience in giving you a, thank a warm of applause. For thank you. So, uh, we... We will have a 10-minute break and be back here uh, just after 11.05.